Hello friends, this is Miss Ella with Harmony at Home. I'm happy to see you again for a new lesson. I was thinking today about all you've learned in the past couple of months. I'm really proud of you for joining me each time, trying new things and practicing what we do together each week. Today we have not one, but two special guests. I will tell you more about them in a moment. For now, I'll just give you a few hints. They both spend a lot of time on stage. They are both part of a large musical group. They might be on the stage at the same time, but they have very different roles. Any ideas? Guesses? Let's play our game first. Today we will start a new musical game. Music is like an international language, because even if you go to a country where people speak a language you don't know, you can still communicate with others using music. Believe me, I have lived this experience many times in my life. The language of music has two important elements. The rhythm, which we have been working on in the last few lessons, and the pitch, which we will be working on in the next couple of lessons. A melody is made out of what we call pitches, which can be high or low sounds or somewhere in between. When we learned our song from Ghana in lesson two, the beginning of the song was made up of different pitches going down, like steps. Senwa de den de senwa, la 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 la. I also told you in that lesson about the seven steps we have in an octave. Senwa, senwa, la 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 la. Those seven steps are seven different pitches we use in music. We call the first three steps Do, Re, and Mi. In our game today, I will need you to repeat after me. Each one of those three notes will have its own pitch. So pay attention to the name of the note and to its pitch and try to be as precise as you can. For example, if I sing Do, 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 you will repeat after me. Do, do, do. Since we have done many rhythm exercises by now, I will use those three notes, but I will also use different rhythms while singing those notes. So you need to pay attention to three things. The names of the notes, their pitch, and their rhythm. I'm sure you can do it. Ready? Do, 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 re, 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 mi, 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 re, re, mi, re, 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 mi, re, do, do, re, do, 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 re, do, do, re, re, mi, match the pitches and rhythms? We will continue with this game next time and we will add two more notes to the ones we learned today. Do you remember we learned about the Baroque period and I explained to you that there were different periods in classical music? 
one of the things that changed a lot from one period to the next is the size of the orchestra and the different instruments playing in the orchestra. In the Baroque period, an orchestra could have included 15 to 30 musicians. We listen to an example with Bach's concerto for two violins. Do you remember the orchestra that was playing the tutti part? Over time, the orchestra got bigger and more instruments joined the group. A big orchestra can have 100 musicians on stage, or even more, and we call it a symphonic orchestra. Let's listen to how a symphonic orchestra sounds. such a wide variety of instruments. Don't you think it sounds powerful and exciting? It doesn't sound the same as Bach's orchestra, right? Not every group of musicians is large enough to be an orchestra. Sometimes there are small groups of musicians who play music together. We call that chamber music. The word chamber comes from the word camera in Italian, that's right. Camera means room. And the idea was to create an ensemble, a group of musicians, that would fit in a room. Chamber music groups can be anywhere from two people playing together to about 12 people playing together. As you will see, in chamber music, there is no conductor. The players sit so that they can see each other and they have to listen carefully to one another in order to play together. It sounds a bit like a conversation between the musicians. So you can play an instrument alone, at home or on stage, and you can also play an instrument as part of a group, a small one or a big one. Today I have invited a friend of mine to tell us about his experience as a musician. His name is Anthony McGill, and he is a very accomplished clarinet player. In fact, he was playing with the string instruments in the chamber piece we just heard a few minutes ago. He plays the clarinet in a very important orchestra called the New York Philharmonic. Let's meet him. Hi, Anthony. I'm so excited to have you here with us today. 
Hi, it's great to be here. Great. So we have two students with us from the Bronx, Pablo. Hi, Pablo. Hi, and Pablo. Michael. Hi, Michael. So they are both clarinet players, and um, we were wondering if you could tell us a bit about your own musical experience. Hi, Mr. Miguel. I started playing the clarinet when I was nine years old. How old were you when you started playing? Hey, Michael. Uh, guess what? I was nine years old when I started playing clarinet as well. There was a band that started at my school, and uh, I wanted to play saxophone, but it was too big. So the teacher told me to start on the clarinet. And also my older brother played the flute, so I wanted to um, play a wind instrument. But a different one. Yeah. Okay, because the sound of the clarinet is amazing. That, that's what I chose, the clarinet, actually. Yeah. I Here love it, too. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, Pablo. Hi, Mr. McGill. I've always wanted to play in an orchestra. What's it like? It's a very interesting thing. It's really fun to be in an orchestra because you get to play really great music um, um, with really great musicians. And so you're in a group with like sometimes 80, 90, 100 people in the big orchestras. You can have small orchestras too. Uh, but there are string players, there are violins, there are violas, cellos, all these instruments. So it's a really big group with all the different musical instrument families. And um, the hard part is that we have to rehearse. We have to rehearse a lot in order to get these pieces together because we have so many people on stage and the conductor in front that we all have to play kind of similar rhythms, but also different parts with different pieces, different everyone's. Some people are playing different notes than you and other people are playing different rhythms than you. So you really have to know your part and you have to prepare and practice your own part. But then you come together and that's what makes it fun is that you come together for a concert. And um, you know, it's a really amazing thing to be able to play this piece together with all these, these, these different voices coming and playing together. So uh, that's what's really exciting about it. It's kind of a thrill. Um, also the sound of the orchestra is like so amazing because it's, it can be so, so loud and so big and amazing and then also really soft. So you see all these people playing this music and it can have all of these contrasts and, and really ex it has exciting moments and sad moments and happy moments. So it's, it's a really great thing. We were studying today about uh, playing as a soloist or in a chamber group um, ensemble or big orchestra. Which one is your favorite? Uh, I don't really have a favorite but um, I do enjoy playing chamber music a lot because it's kind of like an orchestra only with like four people or five people. And so you can hear all the voices, all the different instruments a little bit clearer, a little bit better and kind of hear how your, your notes are interacting with, with other people's notes. And um, so that just makes it um, a little bit more interesting and um, you know, as far as like what the music should go like and what should it sound like, you have a, um, a lot of control over what that is because you're one of the only kind of instruments on the stage. So you get to kind of dictate what happens to the music as you're playing it. Like what story are you trying to tell? So that's what I really like about playing chamber music, but I like it all. Okay, interesting. Um, Michael, what's your next question? What was the most exciting place that you have ever been with your orchestra? I've been a lot of places all over the world. I've gotten to travel um, with, with orchestras all over the place to, um, to Europe and to Asia and to Africa and to Canada. And um, I haven't been to South America yet to perform, um, but I think a really fun place that was one of my early experiences traveling internationally um, was with my youth orchestra and um, I went to Japan, to Tokyo, Japan, and did a tour of Japan um, a long time ago. Um, and that was really exciting because uh, the language was so different and the culture is so different and really great and fun. And um, so that was a really um, pretty a highlight for me when I was younger. And now I've been many times since. Wow, nice experience. Um, Pablo. What is your last question for Anthony today? Do you have any advice for me as a clarinet player, Mr. McGill? 
I would say one of the most important things you can do is practice and to really kind of enjoy your practice. Um, what you do when you to practice well, you really do have to kind of pay attention to what you're doing and you have to do it regularly. So I would say even if it's you don't practice um, a lot every single day, like hours and hours, um, you just need to do it every day just to make sure that you get accustomed to playing the notes, doing your scales and learning all the notes and that you like learn to um, uh, build up your muscles and your embouchure. Your embouchure is your, are your face muscles, as you know, that um, hold the mouthpiece, um, you know, in your mouth. And that's really important that those muscles get strong. Um, so you can allow the air to blow freely through the instrument. So um, you don't stop the air from going through that, the, the reed and the mouthpiece. So that's really important. And to kind of listen and so your air is free and it's free blowing through the instrument. And so you can have a nice, big, warm, expressive sound or tone on the clarinet. That's probably one of the most challenging things, but also one of the most rewarding things about playing the instrument. Thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing your experience with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. That was an interesting conversation. I'm so happy I could introduce you to Anthony. Now that we have spoken with a musician who plays in an orchestra, let's talk about another member of the orchestra who stands on stage in front of all the musicians. That person is called the conductor. He is the orchestra's guide, making sure everyone plays together that all the musicians play in the same tempo. But that's only one part of his important role. In just a moment, I will introduce you to our second guest today, who has lots to teach us about being a conductor, because he is one. His name is Thomas Wilkins. Before talking with him, let's watch a brief video of him leading a community orchestra rehearsal you will see how a conductor communicates his ideas to members of an orchestra using words as well as movement. Yeah, 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 three, four, yeah. yeah. Uh, every, every good conductor will wait for you. We will never, oh, I just included myself in that bunch, didn't I? They, a good conductor will never rush your bow stroke. And we understand that your bow, so your body already knows that the third note has to be longer. Ya di da di, ya da da di, na da 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 di. Okay, go ahead and do what your body wants to do. Three, and one. Good. Good. And doesn't your body want the beat four to be longer? Ya da ya di. Up down. Try again. Three and two. Mr. Wilkins, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce you to my students. Hi. Hi, I'm very happy to be here today. Great. So we have been talking about the orchestra and just spoke to Anthony McGill about his own experience as a musician and as an orchestra player. And we would like to talk to you about your role as a conductor and about your own musical experience. Okay. So I have with me today two students of the Harmony uh, program, Talia from Kanarasi, Brooklyn. Hi, Talia. Hey. And Alondra from Washington Heights in Manhattan. Hi, Alondra. Hi, Mr. Wilkins. Um, so, Alondra, what is your first question for Mr. Wilkins? My name is Alondra. I am nine years old and I play the violin. 
Can you explain what is your role as a conductor? We often get asked this question, and most people think the answers are, well, we tell the orchestra when to start, when to stop. We tell the orchestra how loud to play or how softly to play. We use hand signals to say how fast to go or how slowly to play. And all of those things are very important because you've got a lot of people that you're trying to make sure that they're all doing the same thing. I think, though, that probably the most important thing we do is what we call shaping a musical phrase. And I'm sure you've probably already heard that, even at nine years old. We have to figure out what is the shape of this sound. You know, some sounds are short, some sounds are long. Sometimes you put a long sound next to another long sound. So that's called shaping the phrase. And that's the most important thing, that we all come away with one idea of how that phrase should sound. It's like if I were to say to you the word Caribbean, or the word Caribbean. All the letters are the same, but the pronunciation is very different. Beautiful example. Thank you. Um, Talia, what is your first question for Mr. Wilkins? Hi, Mr. Wilkins. My name is Talia. I am 10 and I also play the violin. My first question is, how old were you when you started conducting? Did you conduct as a kid? I first wanted to be a conductor when I was eight years old. I went to hear this thing called an orchestra and this man comes out and he starts waving his arms and this incredible sound comes out and it turns out that it was the first time I had heard an orchestra and he looked like he was just having so much total fun like he was rolling around and all of that beautiful sound and he was helping that sound and rolling and playing and, and I thought that's what I want to do when I grow up so I took all of my little toy soldiers in my bedroom and I would pretend, and, and I was conducting and waving my arms, but that didn't really count. My first real time conducting was in the seventh grade in junior high school. You guys call that middle school. I was in the string orchestra, I played the cello, and the teacher said, okay, who wants to try conducting? Well, of course I wanted to try conducting because I had fallen in love so many years ago. And so I raised my hand really quickly and I got up and I, start, I tried to start, but it was in three, four time. And that was hard because it was an extra motion. If it were in two, four time, I could just do this all day long. And sure enough, I got confused and I said, okay, never mind, I don't want to do it. And my teacher said, nope. And he came up and said, no quitting. So he took my arm and he guided my hand through the three, four pattern. And then he said, okay, now I'm going to let go. And he, he let go and I went, whoa, look at there, I'm doing a three, four pattern. So I love the fact uh, that my teacher said, there's no such thing as quitting. You just got to try a little harder. And that was, that was seventh grade. So important to have a teacher like that. It tells you to continue and helps you to do that. Yes. Great, great story. Alondra, um, it's your turn to ask another question. Do you like conducting? What do you like about it? I love conducting. In fact, you know, the box that we stand on is called the podium. And I have often said that the podium is my happiest place to exist as a human being. And what I really love about it is I love leading the, the people in the orchestra for sure. And you know that feeling that you get when you first learn, you learn a piece and you got it really well. That's the thing I love about this. I love getting people to fall in love with music. I love it when the players fall in love with music, but then comes the most important part, I think, and that's when we get to share our music with the audience. The best job ever is to get people to fall in love with music. Beautiful. Um, thank you. Talia, what else would you like to know? Do you enjoy conducting kids, and is it different than working with adults? Oh, oh, oh boy, that's a great question. First of all, I will say that when I conduct kids, uh, I conduct them the exact same way as I do with grown-ups. I want them to be artists. I want them to pour their hearts into it. Their skill level is different from conducting grown-ups, but their heart level is exactly in the same place because we're all he human beings. So from that standpoint, I conduct kids and grown-ups exactly the same way. Of course, when I conduct kids, I have to use more words to get to the, the, the end result. Uh, but basically, it's pretty much the same. Great. Um, Alondra, one more question. Did you go to school to learn how to be a conductor? My first time in school, in college, as an undergraduate, 
uh, my degree is in what's called music education. Um, so I could learn how to teach because we spend a lot of time not just waving our hands, but also really teaching on the, on, when we're, when we're on the podium. And now you know what a podium is. And I thought that that learning, that kind of learning taught me a lot more about so many different things about music than just focusing on conducting. So when that was over, I then went to graduate school uh, in Boston and got what's called a master's degree in orchestral conducting. Thank you. I have one question for you. Um, do you have a one favorite experience that you can, you can share with us? I'll tell you the first, it's almost always the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, ladies, once, once you're in high school, you'll probably go to something called All State Orchestra. And that's where you know, all the good players from across the state get together and they form an orchestra for, for a long weekend. It's total fun. And one year I got to conduct the Tennessee All-State Orchestra. And I was trying to get the violins to play something that we call flautando. And flautando, you may not have heard that word yet, but you will soon, I promise. It's a very cool sound. You don't put a lot of pressure on the bow and you don't use a whole lot of vibrato. And when you move the bow across the string, it has this airy sort of really beautiful angelic kind of sound to it. And so I got them to do this just in rehearsal and one kid in the violin section while she was doing it looked up at me and said, wow. She had just discovered a new sound that she could make on her instrument and she was so full of joy over it that it made me full of joy to see her discover something that made her so happy. I can relate to that story as a teacher. This is yeah. the look in the faces and the yeah. eyes opening like that. This is something beautiful. We work for that. <laughs> that's right. We get, that's why we get out of bed in the morning. Exactly. Okay. So uh, thank you, girls. And thank you so much, Mr. Wilkins, for being with us today. It was a real pleasure talking to you and hearing from you about this fascinating career. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Good to see you guys. Bye. 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 You see, I told you in the beginning of our class that we were going to meet two people who are both on the stage. They are both part of a very big group, but they have very different roles. And an orchestra needs them both to make beautiful music. Our lesson is over for today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. See you next time for a new musical adventure. And until then, make it a musical week.